easy thing for you to do Your hand is moving right now You were still showing up At the tomb of every Lazarus And your voice is calling me out Right now I know you're able Oh my
<laughs> I got the thumbs up now. Good morning, Cherry Grove. Morning. Welcome, friends. Whether you're near or far watching online, we are so glad that you are here today. And aren't you glad that we all have the friend named Jesus that we are here to worship this morning? Stand and let's sing to him. Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my Welcome to Cherry Grove. Take a minute to worship and shake hands with your neighbor. you would remain standing. is right. 
will trust Him if only you prove through every moment you live.
Elijah and Luke. The next song we're going to sing is Build My Life, one of my favorites. Um, I was at a music conference in Tennessee, and um, actually Pat Barrett was the one who was singing it, who actually wrote it too. There's a part of this that says, in the chorus it says this. The last line it says, and lead me in your love to those around me. Isn't that the goal? Isn't, shouldn't that be the desire of our heart? Is that we are being led by God to show his love to everyone around us. In 1 Samuel it says this. 1 Samuel 2 it says, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you, God. There is no rock like our God. I'm so thankful for the love that God gives us for his patience and understanding with us. But as we grow with him, I'm just thankful for how he shows us what we should be doing as Christians to show God's love in all that we do and say.
together one more time. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed be We started out on the wrong key. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Esther. say that we would say. there's just brokenness but Jesus came to transform us do you believe that this morning that you can be transformed you don't have to be the same person that's what he can do to you as you just surrender each day to him we just have a brief little video, and I want you to watch this from Kevin. Hello from Henry Ford Liver Transplant Hospital in Detroit. Uh, this is uh, week number seven. Uh, how do you like the beard? I wish I could say that this beard came with uh, a grand uh, hiking or hiking adventure, but this is a well-earned beard from uh, a double transplant uh, of my liver. Um, I have had two transplants the, and two supporting surgeries. The living donor uh, transplant. Uh, Dave did fail. My body rejected it and uh, they had a massive um, clotting along with that surgery. Um, I also have a wound vac going on my belly. Uh, the incision is very large. It is open at this point, uh, and they're using the wound vac to, to pull out um, fluids so that I can heal from the inside out. Uh, the wound is probably the width of a nickel or a quarter and probably that same depth, uh, so it is, uh, it's a very substantial wound. Uh, they tell me that my immune system right now is the same as a newborn baby, and so we are taking every precaution that we can to keep me healthy. The scripture that I've been holding on to is to be still and know that I am God. Be still is a command that is deeper than what I thought it was. And God is so good. We've had so many God things happen. Uh, so many miraculous things that that I can't explain. And God is in control. God is good. Have a great Sunday morning. Uh, love you all. For those that don't know, Kevin and Janet, they, they typically sit right over here, but he had had two liver transplants, and the first one failed, but the doctor told him afterwards, if he hadn't received that first one, he may not have made it this long to receive the second one. And I think maybe sometimes that's part of the story, is God works in unexpected ways. And we don't realize why we have to go through something or why we do but maybe it's through that that brings us out better on the other end. 
So this morning, we're just going to have some prayer time. If you want to come forward, you can. We're going to be praying for Kevin and some other needs. Lord, we thank you that you are not limited to what we just see or our understanding, but that you work beyond that. Lord, that you see in a way that is always in the now, always in the present. And you know what we need even when we don't know what we need ourselves. And sometimes we find ourselves in situations we, we, we never would have dreamed of. And yet you speak into our spirit that you will be with us. We won't go through it alone. You're not going to leave. You're not going to forsake. But you are there for the long haul. And Lord, we praise you for that. We lift up Kevin to you, continuing to pray for his body uh, to accept and to receive. We pray for some of this inflammation that he's receiving this week and getting that you would bring that down. Lord, bring complete healing to him. I pray that for Janet, as she's been down there too, it seems like I think maybe a couple months almost, where they, they just need you. She needs to know. She needs some peace. She needs your strength. How do we get through this life without you? I wouldn't want to. Lord, you know so many unspokens. prayer requests within this very room and we lift them to you but also giving you the freedom to answer in the way that is best for us even if we don't like it Lord we love you and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we pray this in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Well, the kids are dismissed to Kids Grove this morning, and as they are going, just a couple things real quick. Um, most of you know, but if you don't, we are in the midst of a faith promise. So we, we are making a promise. We, we're trusting God, and we are going to hire Pastor Julie in July. And if you would like to be part of that, just make a commitment. You can grab one of these cards fill it out and hand it in and um, you, you can partner in that uh, a couple other things that are happening if you look in your bulletin and we'll, we'll talk more about this as the weeks come up but I want two dates for you guys to put on your calendar we have a kids camp coming up that um, a, lot of, a lot of pastors when I have meetings they share how it was at kids camp they accepted the call into ministry or become a missionary so we rent out the Manton Christian campgrounds. So for a week, there'll be a kids camp going on. But then a Friday, Saturday, and Sa Sunday, we do a family camp. Um, Carrie and I will be in a travel trailer. We'll be down there. We want as many people to come down there. We can have bonfires, enjoy the time, but also be time of worship. There's a pool down there because it's always the hottest. seems like the hottest week of the, the year. The kids remember a time when all we had was a tiny little pool and they did little circles in it and then the next group had to come in and do circles with it. So it is, it is good. They have this gigantic pool now. It's enjoyable. So the other is Monday. If you're not busy Monday, come and see our softball team in action. I mean, you will laugh, you'll cry, you'll pray, but it will be a lot of fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Draw your swords and turn to Acts chapter 14, verse 8. Acts 14, verse 8. Why is it when we talk about love, we often fall into the trap of looking at it like we are looking through the lens of Hallmark? Right? Okay. For instance, I came across this poem this week, and it goes something like this. It's called... You're my everything. You're my love and my life, the air that I breathe, 
You're my soul, my happiness, all that I need. You're my light, my dark, the stars in the sky. You're my ups and my downs and the reason why I try. You're my strength and my weakness, the love from the start. You're my heartache and my pain, the beat of my heart. You're my tears and my joy, the love that you bring. You're my world, my galaxy. You're my everything. Does that not sound sappy or what? You are my everything. Well, what happens when you don't have that emotion anymore? What happens when that person doesn't meet your needs, which is going to happen? Well, the world will tell you, I guess you just go look somewhere else. But what if God's kind of love looks different? What if His love can make a deeper impact in you and those around you? We're going to look at a particular story this morning where we see that love embrace in a very powerful way. So if you've got your Bibles, turn those to Acts chapter 14. If you don't, we're going to look at these up on the screen. Acts chapter 14, verses 8, uh, I think, through 20. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth. He had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and he called out, Stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up, and he began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus. Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priests of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, began bringing bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes, they rushed out into the crowd, and they began shouting, Friends, what are you doing? We are only human like you. We're bringing you the good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with the plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and they won the crowd over. And they stoned Paul, and they dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and he went back into the city. I want you to, to understand what has just taken place, okay? I think we have a map. Katie, do we have a map? There we go. So here is what's going on. Paul and Barnabas feel called by God to share the good news. They've been commissioned by the church, and so they are leaving over here. You see the star? They are leaving there, and they're going to go to Asia Minor, and this will be Paul's first missionary journey, and they're coming up to Pisidia, Antioch. Okay, so here they are. They're starting here. They're heading over to Asia Minor, and they're going to end up right here and start this, uh, this new mission field that has not heard about Jesus. Remember, this is early on in the church, so really almost just the Israel has heard about Jesus. Now, when they arrive, they go up to Pisidia, Antioch, and they are invited. Well, first, where do you think they go to speak? This isn't rhetorical. You can answer out loud if you want. I heard something over here. The synagogue, that's right, because they were Jewish. And they were invited to speak. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that seems odd. Some strangers come in. But, you know, in some ways, we kind of do that. Um, a few months ago, we had the, the Lynx missionaries come in and speak. And, and just this week, I was contacted by 
our DS, who if another DS from Oklahoma is going to be here in northern Michigan. He's like, hey, you mind? If you, you want him to speak on Sunday? And I'm like, sure, he can speak. So on the 23rd, he's going to be speaking. They know that Paul and Barnabas have some teaching in the Old Testament and that they're from Israel and they came from Antioch and they've been in Jerusalem. They have very few visitors from that area. And so they invite them to speak. But something strange happens, okay, here. Because in the early church it was not going well sharing about Jesus, they speak and they begin this way. They start with them being in bondage. They're all familiar with that and how they were in bondage for 400 years and then God used Moses and delivered them and then King David, yep, they're on, they're on board. And then he talks about the promise there's gonna be a Messiah. Yep, they understand they're all hoping for a Messiah. But then he goes into Jesus is the Messiah and he begins preaching about the three years of ministry, but then he was crucified but he rose again and then he begins expounding that the law could not fulfill what was needed for us for us to be ransomed from sin but Jesus did that to forgive us so we could have a new life and here is the miracle really is the temple or not the temple but the synagogue they're at all the Jewish people that are listening do not have the Pharisees or the priests speaking into their ears and they say, we want to hear more. Will you come back and tell us more? And Paul and Barnabas say, yes, we will. But guess what? When they come back, the whole city shows up. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that has to be exciting. I mean, wouldn't it be exciting if the whole city showed up in this church? Guess what? I'm here to tell you, it would not be exciting for everybody because there'd be so many people, things would be broken. Chairs would be ruined. People wouldn't dress the right way. People wouldn't speak the right way. And we are a people who like routine and to be comfortable. It's just the way we are. And we would miss what God was going to do. And that's exactly what happens. There's too many people. And all of a sudden, rumors start spreading around. And Paul and Barnabas realize they have to get out of town. How would you feel if you were Paul or Barnabas and you just left the comforts of your home, all that you know, you traveled all the way to this foreign land to tell them and things are going good and all of a sudden the rumors are spreading and you have to leave. Would you be a little disappointed? A little discouraged? Maybe even upset at God? We're not going to read it, but the end of chapter 2 says this, they were filled with joy. Why? Why? Not because of hardship or, or because of what was going on, but because they were seeing God move, even if it was in an unexpected way that they weren't planning on. And so they travel to Iconium. In the Church of the Nazarene, we divide states up into districts. In Michigan, we have three districts. We have northern Michigan, which is us, eastern Michigan, and then Michigan. Michigan's basically the west side. A few years ago, each district sent one representative and the DS. And so our DS went, and they asked me to go. So I went to this meeting, and there were six of us, and we were down in Lansing. As we were there, we were just listening from one another what God was doing, how he was moving. And I remember specifically one man, because he was sharing about his discouragement he felt God calling him, and he had a, he had a church. He, he had a, you know, a regular income. But he felt God calling him to minister to Muslims. 
And so he convinced his wife and his family. And they sold everything and they moved to Ann Arbor and bought a home right smack dab in the middle of a Muslim community. And he was very white looking. I could probably get away with it, not him. I have been known, by, just to let you guys know, when I grow my beard out sometimes, I had a friend who was a state trooper, and he goes, I want to get on an airplane if I were you. I don't, I don't think he was joking either. So anyways, um, where am I going? <laughs> he moved to Ann Arbor. So he moves to Ann Arbor, and he, he, as he's telling us the story, he said it wasn't going. I wasn't making any inroads. I wasn't making any difference. And then I begin questioning you know, did I do the right thing? I, I'm, I'm forcing my family to do this and move. And um, he was just having a rough time, and he received a phone call. And the phone call was from a gentleman, and I don't want to share the country, but he came from a partic particular country and was a believer. And he asked him, he said, I'm going back for Christmas. Do you want to go with me? And my friend said to him, do you realize they have the, one of the most strictest Sharia laws? You um, criticize Allah, punishable by death. Criticize Muhammad, punishable by, by death. If you are a Muslim who uh, converts to something else, punishable by death. If you're a non-Muslim, which is that's what he is, and someone comes to faith, punishable by death. He says... Are you thinking this is a good idea? He's like, well, I, I'd want you to come and you're going to be an encouragement because there's a group of believers that are there. And he goes, well, I just saw something on the news that they're not issuing any visas or passports to this country. And he goes, well, I, don't worry about that. I have a friend in Washington, uh, the ambassador, and we've built a relationship. I'll give him a call. He says, okay, you give him a call and we'll see what happens. Two weeks later, he gets a phone call. And he shows them, or tells them, I've got five visas. And by the way, it was the only five visas allowed that year. And the Nazarene pastor here from Michigan was one of the only ones to go. So they fly over and they land around Christmas. As soon as they get off the plane, they are met with an individual who told them, you will not proselytize. You will not share about Jesus. You will not do this. You will not do that. Da, 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 da. And then they had to stay there because the next day, remember, these are the only five people who have come into the nation. They're ready for them. They have to meet the general. And as he's telling me this, you can see him perspiring like he was reliving the whole moment all over again. And he's like, it was, I was nervous. I was in this opulent office and here's this Muslim general, general. And he's like, what are you gentlemen doing in my country? And he said, general, we are here because we love the people of this country and, um, and we just want to bless it and encourage it. And then the general looks at my friend, the white American, and he says, I want you to pray. And he said, then he started getting nervous. But he closed his eyes, and he began praying. And this is how it went. And I, re I wrote it down. I recorded it because I didn't want to forget it. He said, Lord, you know how this country has been devastated by extremists. We are praying healing for the general, for his family, for the military, and the people in this country. And then it dawned on him that it had not rained in eight months. And the crops were suffering, and it was just like a dust bowl. And he said, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would send some rain. Amen. And then when he said amen, he thought, I just said Jesus. And he opened up one eye because he knew he was getting arrested. And then he opened up the other eye, and the general looked at him, and he says, I like your spirit. And here's what he said. I now give you permission to go into all the cants. And I said, well, what's a cant? And he says, a cant is a military um, unit or area, but civilians live in it. And he says, you can go into any of them. And when they were done and walked out the door, it started raining. And when he went to go home, the general said, you can come back anytime you want. 
sometimes God moves in unexpected ways and we see disappointment but God sees opportunity and that's exactly what is going on right here with Paul and Barnabas things aren't going the way they want it to go but guess what God's opening up other doors and so they go to Iconium they get there and it says they begin speaking with power and people were beginning to believe but then there were some who were not and they begin working up the crowds all over again and they hear there is a group there is a a plot afoot to hurt Paul and Barnabas and so they move to Lystra and Derby, and that's where we pick it up that's what's just taken place and now God's going to do something that's it's, it's almost unbelievable. And we're going to read this again just by sections. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. 8 through 10. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth. He had never walked. What does that mean? That means his legs look like toothpicks. It does not take very long. It takes a long time to build muscle, but it does not take very long for your muscle to dissipate if you do not use them. And if you have never used your legs your entire life, there is nothing there but skin and bones. And his feet are all broken and he's laying there on the ground. Next verse. He listened to Paul, and as he was speaking... Paul looked directly at him and saw he had faith to be healed. And this is what that means. The man was listening to the gospel message and heard that Jesus is God's son. He died. He rose again. He can forgive your sins. And if he can do that, then he's believing he can fix his legs. Verse 10. And so he called up. This is Paul looking at the man who has faith. And he says this. Stand up. And it says the man jumped. Now, this is really almost a poor translation because the word is halomahehi, which means this. It means to spring or burst forth like water in a geyser. So here's what happened. The man is laying here with crippled all curled up legs with no muscle. And Paul says, stand up. And the man jumps three feet up in the air impossible what would you do if you saw this man your whole life and then you saw him shoot up like a missile well I can tell you what the people in this town did verses 11 through 13 when the crowd saw it they shouted in Lyconian language the gods have come the gods have come down in human form Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priests of Zeus then ran to his temple outside the city, brought back bulls, they brought back wreaths in the city gates, and they began sacrificing and worshiping Paul and Barnabas. That sounds a little strange to me. Doesn't that sound strange to you? But there's a story behind this, and it was an old legend. The Lyconian people, which is this like territory, Believed long ago, Zeus and Hermes came down in human form and walked among the people, but the people did not recognize the gods. Eventually, there was only two elderly, well, elderly couple. They recognized them, and I don't know what I don't know what the rest they did, but they recognized them. And as the legend goes, the gods were mad, so they wiped everybody out. And then they said, you two are going to be uh, protectors of our temple. And they did that. And then when they died, the gods made them into two great trees. So they would always oversee the temple. Now, maybe in this particular temple at this, there was two big trees. And that was the legend that came up. All I know is this. 
This story was passed down generation after generation after generation, and they're going to make sure that never happens again. So they see something miraculous like this happen, and they know, well, this has got to be Zeus and Hermes, and they're going to make sure that they recognize the gods, and so they begin sacrificing to them. Now, imagine you're Paul and Barnabas, and people come running to you, throwing wreaths, bowing down to you. Then another man walks up to you, and you hear, eh, and there's a cow, and they cut the neck off, and blood splatters down, and they're doing this. That's what's going on. Paul and Barnabas want to make sure there is no misunderstanding. And so they run out, verses 14 through 17. But when Paul and Barnabas heard this, they tore their clothes, they rushed out in the crowd shouting, Friends, what are you doing? We're human. We're bringing you the good news to tell you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. He made heaven and the earth to see everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their own way. Here's a key passage here. Yet he has not left himself without testimony should underline that in your bible he has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons he provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy listen here is what paul is saying in a nutshell we are only human beings with feelings hopes and desires just like you we are made of the same material we hurt we bleed we die but there is one greater he is the one who created mankind and all you see. He has created the social order, the moral law within man. We are bringing you the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This Jesus was God's son. He came to pay our price and our ransom so that we can be forgiven and live a new life. And then he says, he has not gone without testimony. What does he mean when he says something like that? It sounds very familiar of what our founders said in the declaration when they talked about uh, these truths are self-evident or they talked about the laws of nature and nature's God that creation in itself tells the story of God. And they're listening. But they aren't done sacrificing and worshiping and guess who comes into the city some old friends of Paul and Barnabas from the other towns and they begin spreading the lies they're not listening to you they're not telling you what you watch them they're not accepting these and all of a sudden a mob begins to form you know it really doesn't take much to form a mob and once a mob forms, all reason is thrown out the window. Just probably last week, I was reading in John Wesley's journals, and he talked about going into a town, and a mob had formed because they heard the Methodists were coming in, and they weren't of the same denomination, so they believed it was of the devil. And they found the constable who was protecting them. Now, if you don't know what a constable is, basically the only police officer in that town, and they beat him. And then he said, as he's telling the story, they, we ran into the house, and there were so many people around the house, we believed they were going to tear the house down with their bare hands as it began to move and sway back and forth. That is what's going on here. They have worked up the crowd. The mob is going crazy. And all of a sudden, they grab Paul. Let's go to verse 19. And here's what it says. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. They won the crowd over. And they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city. Before Paul realizes it, he is grabbed by the mob. Extreme hatred that is, was being moved by probably demonic power, triggering the crowd into a state of complete irrationality, complete loss of reason and civility. It was total mayhem. There was screaming going on. The powers of evil were smiling. The mayhem was unfolding. Paul is grabbed, and before he can even defend himself, he's thrown down, he's kicked, he's beaten, and then he's stoned until it looks like he's dead. 
And they grab his lifeless body and they drag it outside the city because they don't want to look at it and they don't want to smell it. And it doesn't even twitch. He, for all appearances, is dead. And the believers have witnessed this right in front of them and they gather around them outside the city and they are crying and they are praying. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a very traumatic event, but if you have, it can create such an adrenaline rush that a lot of time you'll feel nauseous or even vomit. And my guess is there were some people who witnessed this whole thing unfold and they are throwing up next to his dead body. And then in the most dramatic event outside of the resurrection, he stands up and no words are exchanged and he walks into the city. Do you know who's from this town? Timothy. It doesn't tell us what he said, what he did, but here's what I think happened. I think Paul, who understood the power of the mob, because at the beginning of the church, he was the mob. And he goes into the city and he tells them he forgives them and that he loves them in the name of Jesus. And a young Timothy sees this man show and extend love to people who hated him. And he accepts Christ and it transforms his life. I'll just close with this. Darren was from Australia and he was a troubled kid. He grew up in a broken family. He didn't know what it meant to have a loving mom or a loving dad. He didn't know what it meant to have boundaries and so he lived on the streets. He was his own man, did whatever he wanted. And he found himself in a gang. Darren often would go and steal cars. In fact, they didn't just steal cars, but they often would injure the people they stole the cars from. And they were looking to incarcerate him for a very long time. But there was a rehabilitation place, a Youth for Christ Center, and the gentleman there somehow convinced the judge to let Darren be part of this rehab because they didn't want to see him just incarcerated. They wanted to see his life transformed. And so they convinced the judge, give him into our, uh, our possession. We'll, we'll care for him. There'll be boundaries, da, da, da. And they, they somehow agreed. They were interviewing the director and after a few weeks, he admitted and said, what have I done? He didn't realize how out of control Darren was. It was always someone else's fault. It was never his fault. He was always allowing his anger and his rage to control him. He said one time he heard some commotion. He walked into Darren's room only to see him have a guy in a chokehold and he had a knife in his hand and it looked like he was going to decapitate this guy literally. Well, he went back and he was talking to his wife and they were thinking about Darren and we got to do something if we don't do something, he's going to end up dead. Other people are going to end up dead. And so they, they come to an agreement that they would have him over for dinner. You're thinking, probably not a good idea. And they had a four-year-old boy. And sometimes his little boy would go to him to the center. So he brought his little boy, he's four years old, and they, they came in and they went into Darren's room and Darren was sitting at the edge of his bed and he's telling Darren, hey, Darren, um, you want to come over our house for dinner? And Darren's looking at him, and he's thinking, and he says, without realizing it, without really knowing what was going on, his little boy come running through the doorway, running through the room, and he just jumped up and sat on Darren's lap and just gave him the biggest hug a four-year-old could give anybody. And he had his like head all nestled in his chest and then he popped out and he looked at Darren and he said, Mr. Darren, I am so happy you're coming to our house. Mr. Darren, I'm so happy you're going to come over for dinner. 
and he didn't his dad didn't know what to do darren didn't know what to do it was almost this awkward moment and then darren the little boy reached in his hand in his pocket and he pulled out his little hot wheels car and he said mr darren i would like you to have this and his dad said son that's your favorite your favorite hot wheel car he goes yep i want mr darren to have it he said he could see something inside of Darren begin to change. And Darren said, well, I, I don't have anything to give you. And the little boy said, well, that, that's okay, Mr. Darren. He says, no, I, I really want to give you something. And he started looking around and started feeling in his pocket. And he felt all these keys. And he looked around and he grabbed a bag and he dropped, a, I don't know, it was like 10 or 15 keys. And he zipped it up and he says, here, these are, these are for you. These are keys that help you drive cars. The little boy said, thank you, Mr. Darren. Later that day, part of the program was you were allowed like a two-hour window to do whatever you wanted to do. Well, guess where Darren was going? He was going to meet up with some buddies because they were going to steal some cars. They gathered in their circle, and they were making their plans, and then he looked at Darren, and he said, boys I can't go with you well, what do you mean I've given all my keys away to a little boy these were all the master keys to steal cars and he decided that day he wouldn't do it anymore because he had been trumped by love I think as Paul stands before a shot crowd at least one person saw the display of love and it changed the trajectory of his life. Would you stand with me? I think that is what a world that has gone wrong is looking for. Love. Love that is unconditional and that is a reflection of the Father. A love that says that God can redeem you. God can forgive you. God can change you. If you do things God's way, here is the promise that you can be changed regardless of your past and that the people you come in contact with can be changed. The world is tired of hearing about judgment. What the broken world needs to see is hope. And you are the one God wants to use to see that happen. When we do this, we begin to see the great commandment fulfilled to love the Lord our God with our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, and with all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And maybe the first person you need to start loving is yourself. You want to see change in this world? And start loving those you disagree with. And I'm not saying you have to condone it or you have to agree with them. What I am saying is start looking at them as individuals who are made in the image of God. We can continue to live in the fairy tale of Hallmark or we can start living in the reality of God's kingdom love. You get to choose. Lord, as we reflect on an event that is hard to even explain, Paul knew quite well he was there when Stephen was stoned. 
He may have been the person who initiated the mob to form. And now he was on the other end. Maybe there was a flashback to that moment. Maybe he died. And in that moment, time was stopped and he spoke with you and you reminded him. And then sent him back to go back into the crowd, the same crowd that spit on him, that beat him, that stoned him, to look them in the eye with all compassion and sincerity and say, I forgive you and I love you. Lord, this week, there's going to be somebody. Maybe there's somebody in our family that we need to forgive. Maybe there's someone we live close to that we need to love. You're not asking us to do it because it's easy or if they deserve it. You're asking us to do it because that's exactly what you did for us. You've called us to be your ambassadors. Then I suppose it's time for us to love. Would you help us to do it? Because we can't do it in our own strength. Give us the power, kingdom power, so that this world can see hope, see forgiveness, see real love. And so, Lord, we ask this, and the one who paid it all for us, Jesus, everyone said, Amen. Amen and God bless.